All right, let's open up our Bibles to the book of Romans. Be looking at chapter 15. We'll be out of Hebrews for a few weeks because what I intend on doing is as we are in this season of Advent for the sermon, we'll uh, basically talk about what each Sunday of Advent is centered on. So today is hope. Next week will be peace, and then the next week will be joy, and then the next week will be love. And so today, we're going to talk about hope a little bit. So Romans 15, we'll read verses 4 through 6. When you get there, please stand. We'll honor the reading of God's Word, 4 through 6. And the emphasis will be uh, on verse 4. Romans 15, 4 through 6. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come to you again, thankful and blessed. And Lord, I just pray this morning that you'll be with the preaching and teaching of your word, that you'll open up our hearts, our minds, our ears. Lord, that we would receive your truth. Lord, it's in your Son's precious name we pray. Amen. So as was said, it is the first Sunday of Advent, and... Advent has been around as a tradition for a long time, but it comes from the Latin word Adventus, which means coming or arrival. And in this season of Advent, we celebrate Christ's first coming. He was emptied of his glory. He was born of a virgin, born to die as a propitiation for our sins born to be resurrected and then to ascend to the right hand of the throne of God where he there makes intercession for us. But also during the season of Advent, we anticipate his second coming. Okay, we look to the coming again of Christ. And in Acts chapter 1, verses 10 through 11, when the disciples are standing on the Mount of Olives, Jesus Christ had just ascended to his Father, as he goes away, two angels come by. It says, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. And so they tell them, as you saw him leave, you will see him come back again. And we are to look to that second coming with expectant joy. 2 Timothy 4, 8, Paul says this. He said, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them also that love his appearing that are looking forward to the coming again of Jesus Christ. And it's easy to, uh, to find a lot of Christians today that maybe dread that coming or they, they feel like they're not ready, they want to do this or they want to do that, I need to talk to this person about Jesus. Regardless, we should look forward to Jesus Christ coming. Okay, we should, we should be looking forward to our complete and total redemption. But... His coming again is a promise made in Scripture. And those promises of God spark hope into those who read His Word. And that's what Paul says in Romans 15, 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. And one of the reasons why I'm so adamant that we study God's Word is because there's hope there. If you, if you are born again and you're reading God's Word and you're studying, it's hard to be downtrodden. It's hard to be depressed because you see the message and, and promises of hope 
in the scriptures and we receive hope from that it grows in us from studying his word now of course the hope that that we experience with God is different from how the world uh, talks about hope looking up the the next the definition of hope is it's a desire for a certain thing to happen that doesn't mean it's for sure or assured it doesn't mean that it's a hundred percent going to happen just that you hope it happens because we can hope in a lot of things you can hope that your stocks do well or you can hope that your favorite ball team wins their game you can hope that you get a promotion or, or whatever but those things are not guaranteed. You hope or wish that they would happen. But when the Bible talks about hope, hope that is in the Lord, it is an expectation, a rock-solid expectation and promise that it will happen. That is hope in the Lord. And much of the difference lies in the object of that hope. Because if our object, the object of our hope is it, if it's earthly things, I guarantee you that you're going to be let down sometimes. Your, what your desire is may happen and it may not. You know, before 2008, there was a lot of people riding high on the stocks and the housing market. Then all of a sudden, it, it crashed. Then a lot of people lost that hope. seen people that had their hope in a job opportunity, a promotion at work, and then they didn't get it. And then their hope is lost, and then they become bitter because they didn't get that job. And so when our hope is in these earthly things, our desire may come to fruition, it may not. But if we put also our trust in somebody, it may come to fruition. But a lot of times we get disappointed. If you put your trust in me, I can guarantee you sometimes you will be disappointed. If I put my trust completely in you, if I hope completely in you, I guarantee you I will be disappointed sometimes. The only sure thing in this life, as Hebrews 9.27 says, is death. For is appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. So death is the only sure thing that's earthly that we know of. Everything else ebbs and flows it, it goes with everything else but with Christ with Jesus Christ if our hope is in him it's rock solid I can guarantee you you will never be disappointed in God and Jesus Christ should be that object of our faith the object of our hope you know if we if the object of our hope is these earthly things there's going to be times we lose our hope but if our hope is in Christ we will not lose that hope. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 1, as Paul starts the letter, he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior, and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. He is our hope. There is nothing that, that Jesus Christ said he was going to do that he didn't follow through with. There's nothing that God has said he was going to do that he did not follow through with. He does not break a promise. As Titus 3, 7 tells us that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to hope of eternal life. Eternally. It's a sure thing. And then in Hebrews 10, 23, there'll be a lot of verses this morning, but it says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith. And a lot of translations say hope. The profession of our hope without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. God is faithful that promises. And then in Titus 1 and 1 and 2, it talks about God, which he ordained from the world began. Our eternal life is what it's talking about. He says, which cannot lie. God cannot tell a lie. Now, I think there's an old legend that uh, Abraham Lincoln couldn't tell a lie. I can guarantee you he lied sometimes. But God cannot tell a lie. We have that promise from Scripture. And as he cannot tell a lie, he's never failed a promise. He has never disappointed me. If there was a time I thought I was disappointed in God, let me tell you where the problem was. Me. Because God has always kept his promises. He has always, always done what he said he would do. 
And when God makes a promise, as we look, say, in prophecy of the Old Testament, you can count it as it has already happened. Because God, He lives outside of time. And so when He makes a promise, or there's a prophecy, it's already happened. We just got to wait for time to catch up. Isaiah chapter 9. I said we'd visit these verses. For one, when you look at Isaiah chapter 9 verse 2, it says, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. But we know that that's talking about when Jesus Christ comes into the world. But at this time of Isaiah, it physically had not happened yet, but God is talking like, hey, it's happened. It is happening. So the people that walked in darkness, they have seen a great light. It's not that they will see, they have seen it. And then in Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. But when those verses start out, especially in verse 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. It's not will be born, not will be given. And we can count that as already happened. When we see those promises of God, we can stand on them. We can have hope in them. It's very similar in Isaiah 40, verse 3. When talking about John the Baptist, talking about the one crying in the wilderness, it says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And when Isaiah wrote that down, you could, you could count on it. You can be assured that John the Baptist would come and be that one crying in the wilderness. It was as if he was already saying, There is one coming who is greater than me that I'm not even worthy to tie his shoe. That's hope. It's a sure hope, knowing that what God has said will come, will come to pass. And that's when we look at prophecy of the Old Testament, what was that for? It was to give the people hope that they can be assured that God will fulfill his promise. No matter how bad it was, say when, when they were in the Babylonian captivity or when they were oppressed under the Roman Empire, they had the promise of the Messiah. And they knew that that Messiah would come. Now they may, maybe didn't realize they would reject him when he came. But it was a promise and they could stand on it that Messiah was coming. But now if one wanted to do a study on hope in the Bible, well you'd have to cover the whole Bible. That's what we have kind of talking about in Romans 15.4. It says these things that were written aforetime were for hope that through perseverance and comfort you can have hope in the scriptures. And that's, that's why I say if you study the Bible, it's hard to be depressed. It's hard to be downtrodden because there's so many messages of hope within these words, within what, the, what God has had the prophets and the writers of scripture to write down. But again, in Romans 15, 4, it says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. And so when we look at the birth of Christ and how it was recorded, that we might have hope. When we look at the cross and how it was written down, it's so we might have hope. The resurrection, it is so we might have hope. And all the prophecies leading up to that, so we might have hope. But looking throughout the Bible, the first book in the Bible where hope is talked about specifically and extensively, like I said, we see the message of hope throughout all of Scripture. But the book of Job is the first one that deals with hope quite a bit. And specifically, the majority of it is talking about not having don't have hope. Job perceived as he lost everything he owned. All he was left with was a bunch of sores on his skin and his wife. 
and he perceived that he had lost all hope. And we know that story that that God allowed Satan to take everything from him. Satan, or God told Satan, he said, you can touch everything, leave his life alone. But he was mourning because he felt like he didn't have hope. We see in Job chapter 7, verse 6, it says, My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope. And then in 17.15, he says, Where is now my hope? As for my hope, who shall see it? So he felt like he didn't have any hope. He perceived that his hope was gone because his earthly possessions was gone, his family was gone. But in one moment of clarity, in chapter 19, verse 25, he says, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. That's the message of hope. And so, and again, that was a, a kind of a, a quick moment because he goes on later on and still wants to question God and, and, and all that, but he ends up having to repent to God because he didn't put his complete hope in him. Chapter 42 5 and 6 he says I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear but now my eye seeth thee wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes and it's very easy as we go through this life and, and the trials of this life to take our eyes off God and then we feel like we have no hope we feel like we have no way out but if we have Jesus Christ we always have all the hope we need. I made, uh, I made mention of Miss Marion Winfrey. I saw her this morning, and, and she's been in bad health. And she said, basically all I've got is me and the Lord. I said, well, that's all you need. I said, everything else is just a bonus. And she said, well, that's right. She still has hope because she is born again and saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. One scripture in the book of Habakkuk that I always enjoy reading. And, of course, Habakkuk is where we get the just shall live by faith. But in Habakkuk 3, 17 and 18, it says, Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive, olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God. Of my salvation. No matter how bad things get, I will rejoice and hope in the Lord. The last couple of years here on this earth has been trying for a lot of people. Whether it be COVID and all the things that come from that, with people's jobs shutting down, there's a lot of businesses that went out because of it. But no matter how bad it is, we can see that we can still rejoice in the Lord. The joy and in, joy in the God of our salvation. Now, Job, he, he knew of his Redeemer. He just lost sight of him for a little while. He wasn't without hope. He just thought he was. See, he took his eyes off of, of God and put on everything else. And then, you know, kind of talking like Ad, about Advent, one of the earliest traditions of Advent was 40 days of fasting to help focus their mind on what they were celebrating. And that's not a bad thing, something to help focus our minds on God. But Job was not without hope, but there are people that are without hope. Ephesians 2.12 says that, at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. Those who don't have Christ, they don't have hope. And that's a sad situation. I often say how I don't see how people can get through this world without Christ. And the thing is, they don't. They don't get through this world without Christ. And, and so without Christ, it's easy to see how these outside things here on this world affect them. 
how they can bring them down, how they can be depressed. But with Christ, we have that eternal hope. It's just not for in this life. And a lot of times the message is that we'll feel better here if we have Christ. And that's true. But it's so much more than that. In 1 Corinthians 15, 19, when talking about the resurrection, Paul writes, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. And that's saying we don't just have hope in Christ in this life. We have it for eternity. That that hope does not fade. We can always hope and trust in Christ. It's not like we can trust in Christ and then when we die we're on our own. That's, that's not how it works. We can always trust in Christ. And with that hope, we can have rest. With that hope, we rejoice. We're reborn in that hope and then we work in that hope. And so we can rest in hope Peter at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, he's quoting King David where David wrote in Psalm 16. But Acts 2 verses 25 through 28, it says, For David speaketh concerning him, talking about Jesus Christ, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. David had about as hectic of a life as anybody that's ever walked this earth. Now some of it might have been his own doing. You know, you look at his sin with Bathsheba. But him being king, we look at some of the Psalms. You know, he's talking about why do the heathen rage? Or he's encompassed about by his enemies. But regardless of what was going on around him, whether he was running from Saul, whether he was running from his son Absalom, whether he was fighting against the Philistines, he had rest in the hope of the Lord. He says, moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. Why? Because God said he wouldn't leave him. He says, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. David could count on that. He had enemies from every side, but he had hope that came from God that was within him. And so a lot of people, they don't have that rest because they don't have Christ. And then we can rejoice in hope in Romans 12, 12. In, in Romans 12, he's talking about spiritual gifts and how all the body of Christ have different roles and different positions. But then with those spiritual gifts, as we live a spirit-filled life, starting with verse 9, it says, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. And this is, this is what living a spiritual life should look like. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. When we have those promises of God, we can rejoice in that hope. You know, we can, we can be eager to give praises, not just on Sunday morning, but all through the week because what God has promised us, that God has promised us an eternal life, an inheritance undefiled for us that lasts forever, that moth cannot eat and cannot destroy. Psalm 33, verses 18 through 22 It says, Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him, because we have trusted in his holy name. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in thee. And I, I look at it this way. As I said, when you see the promises of God, 
it's like they've already happened. We're just waiting for us to catch up. I mean, they're that sure. And so, when he says, I shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Now, you think about some sporting event, some football game, baseball game, whatever it may be, and your team may score the first touchdown. But do you rejoice over a win yet? No, because there's a whole lot more to play. And they may come back and win. And so you don't rejoice in that victory yet. You, you're still anxious. You're, you're still afraid to speak too soon, so to speak. But with God, it's like that victory has already happened. And so when God tells us, hey, you will overcome, that faith is the victory, we can have joy and rejoice in that hope already. And then in that hope we're remade or reborn in Romans chapter 5 verses 1 through 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Patience, experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. And so when we have that hope, and we go through these trials in this life, and it says through these trials we get patience, we get experience. Through that experience, our hope gets stronger because God carries us through that. He promised He would never leave us nor forsake us and our hope is only built up and strengthened because of what we go through. Those without Christ in this world, it's very easy for them to get beat down by this world. But those who have Christ are built up. And when we're reborn with that hope, we work in that hope because it's a living hope. And our hope is to be shown to those around us. 1 Peter 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That hope, that rock-solid faith in the promises of God works in us, is alive in us. You know, it's a lively hope, just like in John 4, the living water. Just like in Hebrews 4, the living word. It is living, it acts on us, and then we act with it. Titus chapter 2. Verses 13 and 14 says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. In that hope, we work. We work anticipating the reward and knowing that the hope we have in Christ. And in Psalm 119, Talking about the word gives us that hope. Psalm 119, 49 says, Remember the word unto thy servant, upon which thou hast caused me to hope. This is my comfort in my affliction, for thy word hath quickened me. God's word had made him alive. It had given him hope. And that's what we look at in God's word. We see the promises of hope. And as, as Romans 15, 4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. There's a reason people feel good when they read Psalm 23. Because there's hope in it. There's a reason that, that people feel good when they read Luke 2 and talk about the birth of Christ. Because there's hope. There's a reason that we can feel good when we read about the passion of Christ. Jesus Christ is being beaten and bloodied to death, yet for us, there's hope in it. I'm talking about the resurrection, there's hope in it. Looking at the book of Revelation, there's hope in it. We a lot of times get 
bogged down and confused. Okay, what does this mean? What does that mean? But what it tells us, in the end, Christ wins. That's a promise. And Revelation 1.3 says, Blessed are those who hear the words of this property and keep and do them. And so the hope associated with Christmas and with Advent and the hope that we have all year round stems from the work of Christ. That God so loved that he left all to become like us. He gave all to die for us and then was resurrected again for our eternal life. That's hope. And we get that from the Word. And so I pray that it's not just this time of year that we have hope. We have it all the year round because we have God's Word. We have God's promises. And I'll leave you with these two scriptures. 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 and 17. Now our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us an everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. And in Romans 15, 13 says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Let us pray.